benediction. During the announcements, after the uh, benediction, we're going to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. So be sure to hang around for a few minutes for that. So, well, we're in the book of Habakkuk. Thanks for reading, Jen, for us. You and I, we have all heard news at one point in time that we thought was too good to be true. Statements or sentences that sounded too good to be true. Things like, you'll never have to pay another energy bill if you put solar panels on your house. Drinking a glass of water before bed will cause you to lose 30 pounds in a month. I, is often said on YouTube that I hear. Or student loan forgiveness bill, more recently. Free vacation rental seminar. Zero percent financing. And my favorite, weight loss chocolate. We've all heard those statements or those pieces of news that sounds too good to be true. Well, the people living in the nation of Judah in about the 7th century, they're about to receive news that was too bad for them to believe to be true. When they heard the words that Habakkuk reveals to them that Jen just read for us as a church, that news was too bad for them to believe. I wonder if they said, could you repeat that? Not because they didn't hear it, but because they didn't believe it. They must have thought they misunderstood what God was saying. We're in the book of Habakkuk doing a seven-week series, going verse by verse through this book. Last week, we read about the man, the prophet Habakkuk's complaints to God and his cry out to God and his concern to God about the things going on in the nation of Judah. Habakkuk saw wickedness and violence and evil everywhere in Judah. And this week, we get to read God's response to Habakkuk's cry and concern for the nation of Judah. And what we're going to read is an oracle of judgment against Judah. And first, we see God's intention of discipline against these people in Judah in verse 5, where the Lord speaks to Habakkuk and says, Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I'm doing something in your days. You would not believe it if you were told. This verse 5 serves as an introduction to God's oracle of judgment against the nation of Judah. And God breaks his silence as Habakkuk had been crying out to God, Oh, Lord, how long will I call for help? In verse 2, God breaks that silence and he speaks to Habakkuk. And God is doing something. Those words in verse 5 where it says, Look, observe, be astonished, wonder. Those are four plural imperatives in the Hebrew text that are designed to emphasize two things. One, that there is urgency in this message, that there's something they need to pay, take notice of. And two, that this is a message not just for the man Habakkuk, but it's in the plural form indicating it's for the entire nation of Judah. See, Habakkuk is learning as God speaks here that God has not been idle while Habakkuk has been crying out to God. He is learning that God's silence does not equal God's indifference. Habakkuk has been learning that God is already working on specific plans, even though Habakkuk didn't know what those were. And most importantly, Habakkuk is learning that sometimes God's answers to our questions are not the answers that we want or had hoped for. I'm guessing as Habakkuk was a priest in the temple and crying out and trying to get the people to turn from their wicked ways, he probably wanted God to turn the people from wickedness to righteousness. He wanted God to turn the king's heart from evil towards good. He wanted the people to turn towards God and away from their pagan gods. He wanted God to work in the people and change them, but instead God is going to use a foreign nation to come and punish the people of Judah. Not the answer that Habakkuk probably was hoping to hear. And as we read these words and learn about this man Habakkuk in the setting he's in, we're learning that God is sovereign in how he deals with all people. Sometimes he surprises us in what he does 
And that's because he is sovereign in what he does and what he decides. One commentator on these verses said that what we see here is that God gave Habakkuk a revelation, not an explanation. For what we always need in times of doubt is a new view of God. The Lord doesn't owe us any explanations, but he does graciously reveal himself and his work to those who seek him. This new view that God is giving them is a view that God is sovereign, that he doesn't answer to humans, that he has his own will, and he administers his will according to his decision. John Feinberg in his book, No One Like Him, describes God's sovereignty and defines it for us this way. He says God's sovereignty is God's power of absolute self-determination. God's choices are determined only by his own nature and his own purposes. God's sovereign will is also free, for nobody forces him to do anything, and whatever he does is in accord with his own purposes and his own wishes. And we know about God's sovereignty from scripture itself. It tells us in Psalm 103, 19, the psalmist writes, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. In 1 Chronicles 29, 11, we read, he says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything is in the heavens and in the earth is yours, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Scripture tells us that God is sovereign, and we also learn from Scripture by God's names that he is sovereign. Genesis 14, God is called God the Most High. Genesis 17, he's called God Almighty. Jude calls Jesus Master and Lord. But we also know about God's sovereignty from world history by the rulers and powers that he allows to occur. In the book of Daniel, chapter 2, you might be familiar with the story where King Nebuchadnezzar, this king that's actually going to come to Judah and fulfill Habakkuk's prophecy, the same guy, King Nebuchadnezzar has some dreams that no one can interpret, so they call Daniel up to interpret these dreams. And this is what Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He says, you, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and caused you to rule over them all. That's what Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar. He makes it clear to King Nebuchadnezzar, your power is only power that God has allowed you to have because God is sovereign over the earth. See, God is sovereign in how he deals with all people. Ken Barker, who was part of the NIV Study Bible translator notes, says the Lord's answer indicates his sovereignty here in Habakkuk. He is not bound by the listener's whims or by their standards of quote unquote fairness. God responds according to his sovereign will. He is the Lord of history who works in history to accomplish his purposes. God is sovereign in how he deals with all people, and we're getting an introduction to that here as he reveals his will to Habakkuk. See, Habakkuk here learns God is sovereign in what he does, and next Habakkuk is going to learn that God is sovereign in who he chooses to execute his will. In verses 6 through 10, we see God's instrument of discipline against the nation of Judah. Verse 5 is kind of a brief introduction. Verses 6 through 10 are an explanation for us. Where Habakkuk reveals God's words, he says, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. 
They fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. Their horde of faces moves forward. They collect captives like sand. Verse 10, they mock at kings and rulers are a laughing matter to them. They laugh at every fortress and heap up rubble to capture it. Verse 6 introduces the destruction by these Babylonians. My translation describes who they are. It calls them the Chaldeans. The NIV calls them the Babylonians. And it mentions the Chaldeans because they were a small tribe within the nation of Assyria, the same nation that had conquered Israel in the north 150 years earlier. And the Chaldeans are a small tribe under Nabopolassar who rises up in 626 B.C., gains power, and this small little tribe of people overtake the Assyrian Empire, and they become the Babylonian Empire that is going to come here to Judah. And what's surprising are two things. One is that this small tribe within Assyria is able to rise up and overcome Assyria, but also what also is surprising is that God would allow a foreign nation a wicked, evil foreign nation to come into Judah. See, what God is using is God is using an ungodly people and ungodly forces in order to punish his people that are acting ungodly. And he gives a thorough description starting in the middle of chapter, verse 6. He gives 20 different features of the Babylonians saying that fierce and impetuous people, 20 different adjectives to describe who they are and what they do. He describes their size in verse 6, fierce and impetuous, they march throughout the earth, they seize dwelling places which are not theirs. He gives their status in verse 7, they're dreaded and feared, their justice and authority originate with themselves. They pretty much do whatever they want and nobody stops them. Then he describes their speed in verse 8, Their horses are swifter than leopards. Now, when we read scripture, we usually want to take a simple, straightforward interpretation of it, unless something simply doesn't make sense. And when we read that, we know that leopards are faster than horses. So this is likely just hyperbole describing something in a dramatic way. It's an exaggeration of something to say something very literal. The horses are swifter than lepers to say they are the fastest armies on the earth. This was also important for them because the nation of Babylon was 600 miles east of Judah. It was a foreign, distant group. For them to hear this, they're way over there. We got time to figure out a plan. We know what we can do. We can fix things. But Habakkuk, the Lord is telling them, They're going to come faster than you can prepare. Verse 9 describes their success, that they take captives like sand. And lastly, in verse 10, is a description of their scoffing at all the other rulers and kings. It says, they mock at kings. They took whoever they want. And when it says they heap up rubble, To capture it, it means they would just simply arrive at a city and they were so strong they would pile up dirt against the walls and they would just march up the heap of rubble, the dirt, and go right into the city. The lesson here is that everyone should fear these people, these Babylonians. These Babylonians don't fear anyone, but you, Judah, should fear them. And what we're reading about is God uses the Babylonians as an instrument of his discipline. We're learning how God is just and how he deals with Israel in a specific way. See, God had a unique relationship with the nation of Israel. Back in Genesis 12, God had chosen Abraham from Ur, the Chaldeans, the same little group of people. God had elected Abraham and chosen Abraham And made a promise with Abraham that through you, Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed. That was God's promise to Abraham. So Abraham came to the promised land and then he further clarified that promise, giving the law to the nation of Israel. 
613 laws that told them what to do and not to do. And there was a goal with that law. Exodus 19.6 says, God says, I'm giving you this law because I want you, Israel, to be a kingdom of priests, a holy and unique, distinct group of people that you will look different than all the other nations around the world. And in the book of Deuteronomy, as Moses took the Israelites to the edge of the promised land, he restates some of those laws, but he adds a few things to it. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, God gives them some promises of blessing in those 14 verses. He says, you do this law, you follow me, you love me and stick with me, and I will protect you, Israel. I will bless you. You will be my special people. But in verses 15 through 68, God gives them some promises of curses. If they disobey God, if they leave God, if they worship pagan gods, then God is going to curse them and God is going to allow foreign nations to conquer them. See, God had a specific plan to punish and purify the nation of Israel because for 300 years they had abandoned God, starting with King Rehoboam in 930 B.C. This prophecy is given in about 606 or 607 B.C. So more than 300 years they have left God, they have participated in idol worship and worshipped other gods. And I mention that because I think it's a good caution for us as, as people reading this today. It's sometimes tempting to insert ourselves into some of these prophecies against Israel. It's easy for us to insert ourselves and say, well, we're starting to abandon God as Americans. So God is going to punish us or, or do bad things to us. But it's good for us to remember that God is just in how he deals with Israel in a specific way. Because there were specific promises and covenants given to the nation of Israel. God hasn't done that with America. God had a specific plan for Israel, and if they weren't following that plan, he was going to be just to punish them. And the prophets of Israel tried to warn the people of Judah that the Gentiles would come. Of course, they didn't believe the prophets, and so God sends these Gentile nations. God has to deal with them God is just to do what he's doing because he told them it would happen. God is just dealing with the Israelites in the way he warned them he would. God is just in how he deals with Israel in a specific way here. So God reveals to Habakkuk who these people are. God reveals to Habakkuk what they are going to do. And then God reveals what they are like and what they'll do. In verse 11, we see God's implementation of this discipline against them. It says in verse 11, then they will sweep through, talking about the Babylonians, like the wind and pass on, and they will be held guilty, those whose strength is their God. Verse 1 gives us an introduction to these Oracles of Judgment, verses 6 through 10, are kind of the explanation. And this is the climax where God describes the implementation of this discipline. We learn that the Babylonians, they will reign. Nothing is going to stop them. No one's going to be able to stop them. Thomas Constable, who has free Bible notes, if you ever wanted to look up a good commentary on the Bible, Thomas Constable online in his notes on Habakkuk he says God may seem to be strangely silent and inactive in threatening circumstances he sometimes gives unexpected answers to our prayers and he sometimes uses unlikely instruments to correct his people and that unlikely instrument here is the nation of Babylon but that reign of the Babylonians will be temporary as we see a little hint of that at the end of verse 11. It describes them as those whose strength is their God. Their strength and their self-reliance will be their eventual demise, that God will bring them down because they rely on themselves and their own strength, not on God. 
And as we've learned that God is just in how he deals with Israel in a specific way, it's a good reminder for us that God is gracious in how he deals with us in a different way. The Apostle Paul kind of gently touches on this in Acts chapter 13, verses 39 through 41. As I read this, one of these verses will sound familiar. Paul is talking to a group of people here and he says, Through Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from all things, from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore, take heed so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. There, Paul is quoting Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. He quotes it a little bit differently. He quotes the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, not the Hebrew, and he changes a couple words to contextualize it. But he quotes Habakkuk 1.5 when he's talking about the grace that has been offered to all people in all nations, not just to Israel. See, as you read the book of Acts, you can outline it in different ways. You can outline it based on geography. The first seven chapters describe things that occur in the city of Jerusalem. Then chapter 8 describes the things that happen in Judea. Then chapters 9 through 28 describe things that happen in the broader area of Samaria. That's one way to outline the book of Acts. Another one is based on Peter and Paul. The first 12 chapters are the ministry of Peter. Then chapters 13 through 28 are the ministry of Paul. But another way to outline it is based on the gospel and who it is focused on. The first 10 chapters, the gospel is focused on the Jews, sharing the good news of Jesus with the Jews in the first 10 chapters. But from chapters 11 to 28, it is focused on sharing the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. And that's what Paul is starting to introduce here. When he says, Everyone who believes is freed from all things. That's from the law. You are freed through from the law of Moses. Don't reject it. And the meaning there for us is that you and I, we're part of that offer to the Gentiles. When Jesus died on the cross, he fulfilled the Old Testament law. He fulfilled that promise that started with Abraham that was fulfilled through the Old Testament law of Moses that came through the tribe of Judah and King David. Jesus was a fulfillment of that. And it's through our faith in Jesus that now we interact with Jesus and God, not through a covenant or a law or an agreement, but through grace. You and I, we live in the time of grace. That's why there's not a lamb that we have stored over here that we're going to pull out at the end of the service and sacrifice in front on the table. That's why we worship on a Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection. We don't worship on Saturday, the day of the Sabbath. That's why we don't practice the Old Testament feasts is because Christ has fulfilled that. We don't need those to maintain our relationship with God. We maintain our relationship with God through a person that came through the nation of Israel, and it's by faith in him that we interact with God based on grace. And that's why if you forget to pray in the morning and you drive to work, you don't have to be afraid that God's going to put all red lights to prevent you from getting to work on time. There's not this strict code. If you forget to read your Bible for a week, God's not going to give you a huge energy bill so you can't pay it to punish you. God doesn't work like that. Now, there is a story of Lee Trevino. If you're familiar with Lee Trevino, the golfer from the 70s, he was known to often interact with the crowd and very funny and kind of say anything to get a laugh. And he tells a story about how he was on the first tee trying to start to play golf in a tournament, and they wouldn't let him tee off because there was some thunder and lightning moving his direction. And he had a big crowd there around the first tee, and he, he thought he could get a good laugh, so he pulled out a one iron from his bag. And a one iron is a very difficult club to hit if you're a golfer. Very few pros even played a one iron at that time. And he holds this one iron up in the air, and he says loudly so all the crowd can hear it, 
I'm going to play golf today because not even God can hit a one iron. And Lee Trevino tells the story. These are his words. One week later, he's playing in a golf tournament. They're on the golf course and some thunder and lightning move in. And before he can get off the course, he literally got struck by lightning. And in his words, he says, that was God's divine intervention to correct me. That's what he would say. So if we have those subtle things like we don't pray or read our Bible, those are fine. We love God. If we taunt him and mock him and blaspheme him, that might evoke a response like Lee Trevino has shared. But we worship a God that loves us, that gave his son for us. And his desire is for us to place our faith in Jesus and to obediently follow him. There's not a list of rules or a law that he is trying to get us to follow and maintain like the Old Testament. Christ's coming displayed God's grace of salvation. And under grace, the responsibility of man and women is to accept the gift of righteousness offered through, freely through Jesus Christ. There are two important aspects of the time of grace that we live under. One is that that grace is offered to all people. It's no longer focused on a nation. And two, it was given to Israel as a sample, but now he interacts to all of mankind. That time of grace, that age of grace, is good news. Almost news that is too good to be true. That news that is almost too good to be true is that God sent his only son. He gave his son through the nation of Israel to offer salvation to all of the world. And that faith in his son gives us eternal life. And that's the good news and that's the true news. Let's pray. God, thank you for these strong words spoken to the nation of Judah. They're hard to hear. It's hard to, to learn how you would allow violence and bad things to happen. But it was part of your plan. It was part of what you said would happen. And that you were just and fulfilling your words and, and doing what you said you would do to the nation of Judah. I know sometimes it's hard for us to feel like maybe we didn't do things right now correctly, but God, we know that you love us and you care for us and that it's through your son that we get to experience a relationship with you. We won't be perfect in following you and you know that we won't be perfect, but what's important is that we come to you regularly, that we ask for forgiveness of our sins. And that we, we do that as the basis for our continual, ongoing relationship with you. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll invite you to, if you are able, to stand for the benediction. And then uh, after the benediction, I think Judy has uh, birthdays and anniversary treats for, for us. So... Keep us safe throughout this day, O Lord. Keep us safe through this week until we meet again to praise your name 